Hi, folks. This is Dakota Cohen here, and welcome to the, uh, another episode of the Building Your Permaculture Property podcast. On today's episode, I've got uh, Don Rizika here with me. And Don Rizika is a longtime organic, regenerative, holistic uh, farmer, just an all around awesome guy. He's, he was actually, there, there's two people that, that got me interested in regenerative agriculture and, 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 and to basically come back to the farm. One of them was Wendell Berry, and the other was was uh, Don Rizika. And uh, I remember the first time I met you, Don, was about, I think it was in 2011. It was at a, a university conference, and you gave just an incredible uh, kind of virtual tour of your farm and shared your philosophy. And, and uh, after the presentation, there was a standing ovation. And I think I stood in line for over an hour <laughs> just to just to be able to shake hands with you. And uh, since that time, uh, I've, I don't know, I've been kind of uh, a fly on your, uh, following you around for, for years and you've just been an incredible uh, mentor and friend and, and um, yeah, just a, an inspiration to, uh, to me. And so I, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to, you know, have you on the, the podcast and, and uh, ask you kind of, uh, my, my goal for this is to basically hopefully capture a, a fraction of some of the incredible conversations that that you know I was able to have with you over the, the last few years we've been friends you know sitting by the fireside uh, late at night and <laughs> keeping your wife Marie up so uh, anyways th thanks so much for coming on what, to, what, before, while we start off why don't you uh, tell a bit of your story about kind of how you got uh, your your background growing up on a on a farm and your kind of your way into um, you know re regenerative agriculture and um, and then kind of close it out with maybe the your your history of now you actually you're you're a retired farmer now <laughs> so yeah take it away okay and don't uh, be afraid to interrupt or say that uh, we've covered that let's move on so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Dakota, thank you for uh, inviting me to do this. Um, yeah, the story's long and I'm gonna try and compact it. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up on a, a family farm where we had 16 milk cows, we had hogs, we had chickens, we had broilers, uh, yeah, laying hens, uh, uh, cow calf operation, big garden and uh, yeah, I mean, chores didn't seem like work. Um, it was, it was just, I think our parents did a really good job of explaining to us, this is how life is. And of course, we didn't have TV in those days. And so um, they were kind of our guiding lights. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I have, I have no regrets uh, of, of my life on the farm. Although as I got older, and I wanted to do sports in high school, I found out that a lot of the sports were in the fall or the spring. And in the fall and the spring, uh, my dad uh, need my mom out in the field. So I would be milking the cows when I got home from school. Mom would have supper ready, so I would take supper out. So I thought, you know, I when, when I get, get, out of the, get out of this farm, I don't think I'm ever gonna, gonna come back because I wanna see what the other side of the mountain is like. Ooh. And uh, yeah, so uh, I remember driving down the driveway leaving the farm in 1967 in, I think it was uh, August 31st, I was heading to Edmonton to uh, upgrade my chemistry so I could get to go to university. Anyways, uh, as you know, the, the rear view mirrors on the right hand side, there's a caption there that says, uh, uh, what you see in the mirror may be closer than you think. And I, looking back now, if it would have said that in the rearview mirror, I'm looking back at the farm and I'm smiling to myself saying, I'm out of here and I ain't ever coming back. Yeah. And you know what? The farm had the last laugh because <laughs> uh, the, the, the journey, I think, I think the journey, if we're really open to it, we learn what really felt good uh, about our upbringing and I'll fast forward that. Marie and I got married in 1975 and uh, Anna was born in 78. We moved up to, no I was working on the island. I worked in a logging camp for six years and I was a 
uh, worked for a tree service company. We chopped trees, trim trees. And uh, anyways, we decided that we would move up to Northern BC to get away from the rat race. So we moved up there in 1979 and Matt was born there in November. So our parents, Marie's folks lived in Edmonton. Uh, my folks were retired living in Viking. And pretty soon we realized that we were only seeing our grandparents, our parents, or the kids' grandparents, maybe at Easter, maybe at Christmas. So uh, pretty soon you start thinking, both of us, about what the traditions were in our families. And, you know, it came, came back to food. Food seems to be basic. And some of the other things were the chores that we did. And, of course, the kids are born and we start telling those stories. And we realized that somehow we got to get back because our parents, we need that part of the cycle. If we don't have that, our kids are going to miss out on something big. So we moved back to the farm in 1983. Uh, I should say moved back and we bought the farm that was my mom, well, my grandparents homesteaded in the, about 1910. My mom was born in the house in 1916 that was built in 1916. So uh, the roots are deep there. And so, uh, yeah, our kids uh, went to school. Well, the home, the home place where I grew up was only uh, across the section about a mile and a half. So uh, our kids went to school locally and yeah, we, we kind of uh, got into the community and I have to admit that we were doing conventional farming and I, everybody else was getting bigger and I thought, well, I was farming with my brother and maybe, maybe uh, that's something we should like to do. And he, he was older than myself and the kids were older, so he was very keen to do that. And uh, yeah, the very fortunate thing that we had was we had a crop failure the first year and people would say, that's fortunate. And um, yeah, it did because it put us behind the eight ball very quickly to the point where we hadn't, we hadn't uh, borrowed any money for an operating loan for the first five years. And after that, uh, 5,000, then 10, it just kept going up and up and up and pretty, and you know, we, we didn't, we weren't, uh, we, we bought all second hand equipment. Uh, we did pay too much for the land, of course, but it was, it was, uh, you know, in the family, we were going to be close to family. So kind of rationalize that, but yeah, we uh, kept getting to the point where this isn't working. So that's 1983, we arrived in 1995 after harvest, Marie and I were having, the kids were, had gone to school, we were having breakfast and uh, we had that knock them out conversation. You know what, this isn't working. So uh, we talked about what do we do? Do we stick around here or do we try something different? And since I don't have a degree in anything, I don't mind working. I, I could probably do anything I wanted to, but yeah, you start thinking of that. I was 46 years old. So uh, I went to get the mail. I think it was the next day and opened the mailbox and there was a leaflet on top. It said, if you would like to get off the agribusiness treadmill, we're having a holistic management uh, kind of a information meeting in cameras. And so uh, Marie was going to come with me, but she's a teacher and she was doing substitute teaching. So she said, you know what, you go ahead. So there were 72 people showed up and it was a very interesting, interesting presentation. And so uh, I told Marie about it and she said, well, what do you think? I said, well, let's give it a try and then we'll make our decision what we're going to do. So it was an eight day course, two days a month for four months. And on the way home from that course, we were like two teenagers on our first date. Just We just couldn't wait to take on the world. So, you know, we sold two quarters of land, which right there, there's a stigma because if you're selling land, that means you're in trouble and it's probably financial. Yeah. Or maybe you found land closer and, 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 and you're going to sell that and buy this. But no, we were in debt. And um, I think that uh, it's kind of like alcoholism that uh, you have to be confronted with that. And uh, we, we were. And so, yeah, folks, we have a problem. We're in debt. So we sold the two quarters. Uh, the farm had borrowed money from Marie over the years from her substitute teaching to the point of almost $50,000. We sold all of our farm equipment, two quarters of land. On May 1st of 1999, the, the land was paid, the farm mortgage was paid off. And we, uh, we'd actually started after taking holistic management in 95, 96. The spring of 96, I started building, uh, well, the Joe Salatin model, I eh? started building shelters for hogs and poultry and everything. And we, we started a different way. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we told people what we're gonna do and they kind of were 
back off a bit and they say, gee, that's that's kind of going back to the 50s, the way you were raised. And I said, yes, it is. But I said, I can't handle debt. And our debt load was uh, about $250,000. So um, that was huge. And so, uh, yeah, after taking holistic management, that first spring when the snow went off the land, I went back and I started walking around the farm. And they told us that uh, certain signs to look at if you've been overgrazing. Well, we had tons of yarrow, tons of sage, a lot of indigenous stuff coming in. And <clears throat> solution was give it a rest. So we started following the holistic uh, principles. And I, I'll backtrack here a bit. Holistic management, different people have different ways of describing it. But really, it's living in harmony with the ecosystem. And that's so important. And in 1999, it's interesting, I was at a water, uh, there was a, in our county, there were a few people wanted to start a watershed group, and I really, I just felt that, you know, let them do it, but they dragged me in, and we ended up starting it, and so I went to one of the first get-togethers to learn from other Albertans who had started watershed, so at that session, at the coffee break, I was standing there, like, I'm really, I'm an introvert. <laughs> And I was standing in the corner by myself and the facilitator came up to me and she said, uh, she told me her name, uh, Adele was her name. And uh, she said, what's your name? I told her and she says, uh, what do you, uh, you know, what's your interest here? I said, well, we've started, a, uh, we're starting a watershed group in the county. And she says, how, how do you farm or what do you do? I said, well, we farm. And uh, she said, what kind of farming? Well, I said, we're just starting to get into this model of it's grass based model where you raise poultry and pork and grass finished beef and all that. And she said to me, I, oh, I said, do you have it books, any books you would that you could suggest I read? She said, read anything by Wendell Berry. And you know what? She disappeared. I haven't seen her since. You know, Dakota, there's something going on here. Yeah. And uh, I started, I've got most of Wendell Berry's books, and now I'll probably get into his fiction, but he, um, he, he wrote the Bible, um, such an emphasis on, on nature. Uh, he and Wes Jackson, who's, Wes Jackson started the Land Institute in Kansas, and they've talked about governments, they get in for four years, they have it, they put in their plans, the agricultural plan. And after, if they get, if they get booted out, or if, if the other party gets in, they come up with another plan. Eh? And, and what Wendell and uh, Wes were saying, we need a 50 year plan. And so much wisdom in that. And so uh, when we, when we started farming this other way, we started looking at, you know, have, have a long term plan. So the long term plan was to put everything into pasture. And, uh, you know, it sequesters carbon. Uh, it's uh, it's great for winter grazing. It has a lot of uh, protein and uh, huge benefits. And so, uh, you know, as we went along, we met the people from Cows and Fish. We met uh, Ducks Unlimited. We met uh, uh, other watershed groups. I went on a lot of uh, tours and uh, it was interesting over the and PFRA was still going then so we met their agroforestry people they met the ecologists and so uh, all of these people started hearing about our story and they said you know can, we can help you so they all started showing up and uh, there's a saying uh, uh, proverb that says uh, when the student is ready the teacher appears but it's uh, that's not right it's when the student is ready the teachers appeared and they just kept coming so when when people come to our farm, they say, wow, you've really done a great job. I say to them, well, we is all of those people that have worked with us. And I mean, people like yourself who, I mean, when, I, when Marie and I first toured your farm, we thought this is so far ahead that most people are going to think you're at the very back of the pack. And so uh, I, I, I've really been inspired by what you've done. And I guess one of my goals now is that uh, now that we're living in cameras and we haven't bought a place, but uh, we're going to probably buy something in the spring and I'm not so sure if it's going to be an acreage, but um, I, I really want to learn more about permaculture and start um, growing food the way permaculture does it and not not disturbance you know all those things that you're doing and you I mean it's a design and holistic management yes we designed the farm some of it was unknowingly because if you're going to be organic you're going to have to have that uh, 30 foot buffer so we put trees all around and uh, we started learning about native pollinators and habitat how important it is and um, 
Yeah, uh, it, it's it's been a heck of a good journey. And some people have said, you know, when you when you get to the end, like the goal, you know, can you imagine how it's going to be? And I says, I really don't care because I said the journey's been so good that uh, if the lights go out just before I make the step into home plate, that's good. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's the Coles notes, which is way too long. <laughs> No, that's that's great. I mean, you've you've um, you guys have so that, just kind of I want to get the the timeline straight here. You said it was it was ninety six was when you guys made the transition. Was that right? Or was yeah, it? yeah. We took uh, the holistic manager the first two first two months of ninety or the, uh, November December of ninety five and then ninety six yeah. um, uh, February and March. Uh, pardon me, June, January and February. So that's when we started the, the holistic. Yeah. 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 And so at, at that time, what did your farm look like? Like what? Uh, well, uh, after we sold the two quarters, we, uh, let's see, after we sold the two quarters, we ended up with a section of, uh, okay, there was 300, almost 400 acres of cropland. So mm -hmm. our, our last grain crop was grown in 1997, and it was only 22 acres of, of wheat. And after that, uh, we seeded everything down to tame pasture in 97, uh, actually 97 and 98. So uh, in holistic management, something that Joel Salatin said is that uh, probably a good idea to get rid of anything that will rust. And so we took that pretty seriously. Uh, we, my brother and I had a combine together, so we sold that out. Uh, we did keep the, the tractor just because uh, uh, we, we thought, well, we, we might, we might uh, get somebody to bail for us or something. We might need the tractor or just to clear the driveway. And it was already an antique. So um, yeah, we went down to basically having an ATV and uh, that was it. It was all agrarian, which uh, when, you're, when you're close to the land like that, you, you tend to get closer to the land. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just like, I don't know how many times I've toured your farm, but it, one of the things that really does did stand out for me was just how little equipment you guys had and you I mean so you're, you're managing well towards the end it was almost 800 acres wasn't it or is it six no 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 we were down to 640 yeah 640 yeah, you're managing like you know 640 acres with uh, what would you say like twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment or less like the you're pushing it yeah <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. it's just it just blew me away that how how um kind of bootstrap <laughs> and and streamline everything you had was and and um you know it, it's just coming home and looking at all of our our equipment and like none of, none of it was new either but you know we had duplicates of everything and and uh it uh it was just that was one of the things that really stood out to me is is you don't have to you don't have to have a quarter million dollar combine uh just to get into this <clears throat> well you just you know, I just was picked up on something that you said there, and I think that you're aware of this, and I'm sure a lot of people that are in permaculture are aware that uh, we're in the process of re redefining success and redefining, uh, redefining progress. Yeah. And I, I know we, because you have to, you have to, to make a living off of this, you have to be able to sell what you raise on that farm. And so we try to, uh, we tried farmer markets for three weeks, and it's it's a lot of work. Uh, we're a mom and pop operation; the kids were all gone, yeah. so uh, that was uh, and you in the winter time. And darn, you know, every time that we went, it was about thirty below. So you're loading the, the truck about uh, six in the morning. You fed the cows. You get home at about four, and the waters are froze up. So uh, you know, it takes the fun out of it. So we said, let's open the gate and let's let's just be totally transparent and let's give tours and we're just going to say you know what if you want to come uh it's going to be show and tell so uh, we we really uh re we enjoyed that and we learned a lot about people um what 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 really uh stands out for me is that just about everybody i meet or that we met on those tours had some kind of a longing or a desire or uh, some kind of a passion to see something being cared for. And like they saw the, our dugouts fenced off. Why did you do that? Well, we want to keep the cattle out. We want to keep the, the manure, manure out because if we get into some droughts, the phosphorus in the manure, you're going to have algae, algae blooms. So uh, those little things, people pick that up. And uh, But sometimes when people would leave, they'd say, 
you know, how, how are you doing? And you know what, they, they're not saying what's happening here. They're asking how much money are you making? And of course, I would never say, I just say, it's really going well. And, so, you know, I think looking back, I should have said uh, financially, you know what, a lot of, a lot of times we break even uh, because we're investing a lot back into the land. And uh Really looking back now to Dakota, I wish I'd have put more emphasis on that because I think society has uh, believes that standard of living and quality of life are the same thing, and they are so far apart. Uh, I know some people that have that think standard of living is is the best. I mean, they've got the latest of everything, and uh, for us, we 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 didn't have that. But when you sat down to have a meal at our place basically the spices and uh, that was about the only thing that came from town and mm -hmm. i mean okay the cow that we had the, the milk cow disappeared in that but uh we, we really took pride in that and we gave thanks every time we had a meal and uh yeah the, the kids they all were in 4-h and uh, they still talk about that was one of the best things that we could have done for them public speaking really helped them so uh yeah it, it was it was really good and we have we have no no regrets yeah no, that's, that's, um, <clears throat> and so just, just to kind of finish off the, the story um, before we kind of, you know, go mm -hmm. a bit deeper into your operation, um, there's been a big change in, in, in your life. You've alluded to a little bit so far and, and um, you, uh, you're a retired farmer now. <laughs> so what's, what's that been like? What was, what was it like to, to drive away from the farm again and, and see it in the rear view mirror uh, for a second time? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll have to fill, fill in a few blanks here that'll kind of make the mud clear. Um, we, we decided in 1917, well, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the farm in, 19, in, in 2015. So in 2017, uh, well, we knew the kids weren't going to come back to farm. So 2017, uh, I said to Marie, it's time. And she looked at me and she said, what do you mean it's time? I said, it's time. I said, it's time to get ready to sell the farm and move on. And I think she was kind of shocked, but uh, yeah. And you know what? Within uh, probably a couple of days, we figured, heck, we can put this place up for sale and it'll be, it'll be sold in probably two months and we can just get on with life. And uh, then we started looking around and my uncles had built granaries probably starting in the 1920s they were still around the yard there was a lot of cleanup to do and you know what it took us two years to get that done i completely did the corral system but all this time that we put the farm for sale by word of mouth uh because uh, i i've i found that a lot of realtors don't know much about organic farms they don't know much about regenerative agriculture they don't know much about holistic management and that's not a put down. It's just that, you know, there's not a lot of realtors have ever had a, an organic farm for sale. So we felt that since we had so much skin in the game, I think it would be valuable if either we were the ones to take prospective buyers around. So we found out fairly quickly that we could have sold the farm uh, probably, uh, oh gosh, uh, probably in 2018, but uh, they, they were bigger farmers and to make it pay, they've got to clear everything and drain everything. And we had actually asked the county if they could become a land trust in 2017 and they did. So we put uh, 44 acres into a conservation easement so that all of the trees we planted over the years for uh, shelter belts, wild habitat plantings and eco buffers, all of those are protected. The, the major riparian area was protected. And basically, because those were some of the hubs of the places where ecosystem, ecosystem services were happening. I mean, Native Prairie, uh, you know, it contributes a lot. Everything does on the farm. But um, what we realized, we, we showed the farm to probably over 30 either couples or groups or individuals. And I would say, Oh, between 10 and 15 percent knew the value of ecosystem services, which is pretty alarming. And uh, remind me to talk about ecological debt down the road here, because that's that's a big thing nowadays. But yeah, um, so we, we we turned we turned a few farmers down. And uh, another thing is that it was a burden for them because we said that the acreage there could never be acreage subdivided with the farm side because that's happening too much. Mm. And we feel that 
it, it would be good to have that there so that somebody would actually live there and farm the land. Yeah. And this young couple came along, they shared our values. They were totally right in tune with the uh, conservation easements. They uh, actually, uh, one has a degree in agriculture. I think another one has a degree also and also in uh, conservation. So they're, Marie and I have felt that they were the right people and it took almost three years for them to come along. But uh, uh, again, I, I was on uh, Killam Hospital Board for 10 years and well, oh, we, uh, you know, you deal with people uh, who have loved ones who die. And so at one of our meetings, somebody talked about a really good book to read. It's, it's by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It's called The Five Stages of Grieving. Yeah. And I never, I haven't read the book, but when we, when we decided we were going to sell the farm, something whispered in my conscience, you should maybe just maybe think about this grieving process because if you don't go through it it's going to really be tough on you later so well first thing we did and and marie really beat me to it she uh, increased her daily walks to instead of once a day morning uh, afternoon she would go up on the hill there where the big tank is for the watering system she took a stool up there and she she would sit down and she would look at the farm and she would give gratitude for the time we had there and uh, Dakota there's not a better way to say goodbye than to give gratitude for what that land has given back to you so and I did the same thing in the last year that I had the cattle and the chickens and all that I thought you know what this is probably going to be the last time and I just feel so blessed to be able to have done this the people we've met the relationships to, to people to organizations but the relationship to the land again it comes back to the land so uh, yeah uh, it was uh, it was really good so uh, there, there's okay you can have anger you can have disbelief this ain't happening to me but if you can if you can handle those I, I the one that stood up on my list and it's not even on her list but it's bitterness. I, I've run into people over the years who say they're going to stay at whatever business or occupation they have. They're going to stay doing that till they can't do it any longer. But they don't realize that sometimes when you can't do it any longer means you've had a stroke, you're in a wheelchair, you can't talk, and now you have to hand off to somebody else to get rid of everything, to you know, to, to power down and, and get out of business. And I could not imagine if that would happen to me because the kids, to have them come home and leave their jobs, uh, that would have been tough on them. It would have been tough on Marie. So we said to ourselves, you know what? Let's do this so they don't have to do it. So we did. So, you know, we, we tried to get all our ducks in a row and, and I think we did. So uh, when people say now, how could you, how could you leave that farm? You know, all the things that you did there. And I said, you know what? Um, we're not going to forget it, but I said, life goes on. I said, uh, you know, on a, on, on a, you know, after, uh, after a few too many beers, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll make it to 80 or so, but you know, the reality is there, uh, time comes and time goes. So uh, I'm, I'm aging with grace and, uh, you know, accepting the aging process and uh, yeah, the farm, it, it was good to us, but you, I feel that you just can't cling. I mean, we all had our favorite car. Uh, we all had our favorite piece of equipment, but you know what? It, it, you have to, it, 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 we move on from that. And you know what, that was my favorite farm. That was our favorite farm, but you have to move on. And you know, the kids were very supportive of us. They, and they still say, boy, the good times we had there. Thank you for doing that. Not, gee, we wish that you could have, stuck, you know, stuck it out longer, but Toga, Dakota, it's, uh, it was like somebody wrote the script and they knew what they were doing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, moving into cameras now, uh, I got to admit that, uh, biggest challenge is to find something to do and I'm not one I really enjoy reading a book but to sit down and read a book all day that just doesn't cut it eh? and I was told by uh, a, a doctor one time he said and actually quite a few times he says Don when you sell that farm he said don't stop because you've been really active all your life and he said if you stop I'll be at your funeral within a year so <laughs> anyways I uh, we, we, we got moved in settled down and I found out that you know what, I'm not getting enough exercise. So uh, we started doing a lot of walking, but as you well know, you live in a city, you walk on concrete, you walk on pavement, you don't have that, you don't have that touch with the land that you really need. Yeah. Land gives us reflectology. There's 13 <laughs> points, pressure points on our foot, nerve endings that need to be, you know, they need to be massaged and you can't do that on pavement. So fortunately we have a park, about a 10 acre park behind the house. And uh, 
when you when you no longer have those farm chores to do and you're thinking, what can I do? Well, your mind wanders. And my mind wandered back to the good old days of growing up as a kid. Mm -hmm. And as busy as my mom and dad were and as busy as Marie and I were, my dad always had time at certain times of the year, usually spring after the crop was in. And then we got this free rain. He would make a kite for us or kites for us. And my dad was a really good kite maker. So I'm reading the Western producer in that June. And there's an article in there about the kite guys at Bentley. They have a store and they sell kites. So I said, heck, I got to get some kites. So I ordered three kites. And with COVID, you know what? Not a lot of people around. I had the park to myself, eight acres. I took the two kites out there. I got one up, tethered it to my lawn chair, got the other one up, and I just sat sit back and I dreamt about the good old days. So we've landed. <laughs> Jeez. You know, that I mean, if if it isn't painfully obvious that you know, folks listening and watching this is just how um like the power of 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 like having a, a positive mindset and and just and how your perspective changes anything. I mean. I, I don't know how many farmers, like, well, there's, there's only a few farmers I can think of that have, have gone through like as many shifts uh, as you have. And, and, and like you said, aren't bitter or, or, or resentful or, or angry about it. And uh, it just, um, yeah, your, 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 your youthful kind of childlike uh, energy. I mean, just like every time I go to your farm, I get, I get inspired about my place. Cause like, just, you know, you've, you've mentioned that you, you know, you want to learn more about permaculture. You, you know more about permaculture than, than probably Bill Mollison did because he, like all the connections and, and things between you know, the, the different ecosystem services and the, and the bluebirds and all these different things. It's um, like you, your ability to tell stories about that stuff is just incredible. And, and I, I really do adm admire your ability to, um, to kind of end it on a high note and um, and to to move on. I, I don't I don't know if I could. <laughs> uh, I I I can't imagine having to to leave this place. But um, hopefully I've got a few more years ahead of me before I have to make that decision. Um, <clears throat> Actually, Dakota, one more connection I'd like to make, and this you you and us uh, were both involved in that, and that was when Spirit of the Land came along. Yeah, and. Uh, that was at the university here, Augustana University, and a uh, good friend of yours and mine, Raj, and uh, Ditmar Mundell, the professor, uh, they came up with this idea of spirit of the land, and uh, they started showing up at your farm with uh, students, and then they'd come over to our farm, and they'd spend an afternoon or two or three hours there in the evening, and then we'd have a sit down and uh, questions and stuff, and you know, Dakota, that actually made me think more about what we've been doing, yeah. and uh, how important it is to tell that story. Yeah. And I, I, I think that uh, the tour thing for us was really important. And, and you and I both know that the word sustainability has been abused to the point where we hate to use it anymore. In fact, <laughs> we bite our tongue eh? or yeah. put our hands behind our back and cross our fingers. Yeah. But uh, people, quite a few people, just before they got in their vehicle to leave after a tour, they'd say, Don, Marie, it's really nice to have visited a sustainable farm. And I, I, I let people go with that for a couple of times. And then I finally said, the next time, I said, you know, this farm can do everything right with the land. But I said, unless the consumer mm -hmm. is willing to pay a premium, and we did charge a premium, mm -hmm. but the premium is because we don't have economy of scale. We can't we can't compete with cheap food or globalized food. So I said, you're you're making a conscious decision when you support us. That you're spending more. So I said, when that lifeline gets cut, I says this farm is no longer sustainable. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, Augustana was a huge boost for uh, for us for our farm, and I, I think for you, you and I both made lifelong friends there, and those relationships. Uh, I think you and I could both, well, you've written a book already, but we could really come up with quite a long book of uh, relationships and how important they've been. Yeah. Well, and the, like that for me is, is um, like, I, I've, what, what drew me back to the farm when, cause you know, I, I left for the same reason you did, which was, well, this is a, a ton of work and there's no money and, and, you know, you know, the anger and the resentment that you see in, in a lot of the kind of, uh, you know, elder agrarians who, who have who've been trapped on that, you know, agribusness treadmill, like you said, uh, I, I didn't really want to take part in that. And so I, I left the farm and, and, but when, whenever I would come back on, you know, on weekends when I wasn't working, 
it was just like just having your hands in the dirt pulling weeds was just it was like the only thing I wanted to do it just like like I just came alive and 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 then it was after like I said meeting guys like you and and listening to Wendell Berry and hearing about permaculture that I decided you know like like kind of all all roads lead to to agriculture in terms of all these problems in the world and um and I, I wanted to come back and, and make a go of it but like th to not have that that connection like to, to not have been born on a farm like you and I were and and to to know when so that that piece is missing uh you know the spirit of the land class that you, were, you mentioned which for just a bit of context, it was a it was a it was a university program where the, the the homework was to basically sit out in a field and like meditate. It, it was this idea of of like uh, contemplation and um, and compassion and, and and kind of connection to place. And so you know there'd be you know lecture sessions where you you know you'd read certain books or watch certain videos, like particularly Wendell Berry and Aldo Leopold and and stuff like that and then you you know go visit these different farms like yours and, and mine and and uh and then have these group these group sessions and and one of the things that I, I got to do a couple times with these these students which I and I know you did too was I I so a couple of years I went to every single class uh they met once a week but then when I, I couldn't do that I would try to go to the first class and the last class and the transformation that happened in those kids uh, was, I mean, one of them that stood out to me, it was, um, <laughs> you know, we were, we were kind of going around the circle doing an introduction, like, why are you here? And 50% and, and of the class said, well, I'm here because my friend said that you get free, a free meal uh, once a week and there's no homework. <laughs> And, uh, or, you know, one of the kids just, uh, the, it was another fellow, I can't remember what his name was, but he was, uh, he was from Japan. And uh, he, uh, he said, kind of grumpily with his arms crossed, like, I'm here because all the other classes were full. And he was just miserable about it. And, th and those kids, like that, that, that Japanese boy, the, the um, like fast forward, whatever, a few months, and the transformation that happened in those, those people was unbelievable. Like they were, in, they were in tears. They were telling stories about, um, you know, the, the, you know, their little gardens that they had back at home, like they had found that connection to place. And it was just, it, it never failed to, to, um, to jump out at me. And, and one of the things that, that it's, that I've, I think is, is painfully obvious is like this, this isn't, this isn't like a, our problems aren't how to grow food. Like, like we have, we have all the skills that we need to, to grow food and, and do it in a, you know, quote, sustainable way, or in a, even in a regenerative way. The problem is it, it's a problem of spirit and, and connection and, um, and, uh, you know, ethics and things like that. And, but what, what was, I said, what blew me away was just how, how quickly when people would would tour your farm and they'd hear your stories about the bluebirds and how they're connected to this, um, how somebody with zero agricultural background could just get it like that. And the other part, Dakota, that I think was really important is it was a community course. It was open to the community. So, you know, you had people my age there and, uh, you know, young students at university. And I think that's really good to have that uh, that diversity. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and and just it was such a phenomenal class, and it's I mean it's it's um, a shame that it it, um, it kind of had to go, but it it uh, it didn't fit into the you know didn't check the boxes of a, of a regular university course. But I, I'm I still meet students from those classes, uh, you know, from the like, I went they, they, they happened for four or five years, wasn't it? And um, I had I still meet meet students that took part in some of the early classes, and they said it was yeah. you know, the most the best course they ever took. And, uh, and what's, <clears throat> so kind of coming back to the, um, your, your farm tours and stuff, and I agree, like farm tours have been the, the single most important aspect of our, uh, like I call, most business would call it marketing, I call it education, which is like, that's, why would somebody want to pay a premium on a price unless they know why there's a premium? And so you have to, you have to teach people and, and there's no better way for people to just come out and walk around a farm. And and I got, it's, it's always blown me away that every time we do a free farm tour, like with, we, we do a hundred people and every year, even from the, from when we first started doing it, uh, was it back in 2012, 
when like nobody knew anything about us right from that point it was like farm tour they were just they were people came yeah and so i guess i was just curious how, how many how many farm tours do you think you you did over the years how many people do you think came through your farm oh i don't think we we started in uh 97 was the first one yes. so let's see 97 to 2017 roughly 20 years oh ah uh, gosh i'd say somewhere between 150 and 200 a year but people people you know Dakota, uh, if if we had a okay open farm days yeah uh provincial kind of a how would I say, uh, an awareness of, of uh, allowing people to hook up with farms like yours and ours and other other operations, uh, you would put your name on and you didn't know who was coming. And there was years we had one people would come maybe in the morning, in the afternoon, there might be five or six or, and the tour goes on no matter who shows up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I people say, well, was that disappointing? And I says, you know what, this whole thing is about one person. If one person has a take home experience that they, that it's changed somehow their, uh, some kind of their outlook on, on nature or on, on the food, et cetera. I said, it's been worth it. So I said, if you have 20 and everybody says, well, this was a waste of time. You know what, the time I invested in that one person that paid off big time. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's really like the, um, you know, the, the, some of from the presentations that I've watched of yours over the years and, and the dozens of farm tours that I've gone on, I, I can't imagine you've ever had a group that didn't leave with, um, with some, you know, like I said, every time I take a tour with you, I, I would learn something new that, that I didn't pick up before. And, and, um, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really, really inspiring the, all the work that you've done. And I remember one of the things that stood out to me, you're talking about exercise is, uh, you had a step counter for the last couple of years you were on the farm and you, well, you see you walked like 20 kilometers a day every day uh actually miles i um <laughs> our, our son gave uh <clears throat> marie and i both each one and i i put it on february 17th of 2015 and took it off february 17th of 2016 i wore it for one year and i put on 3092 miles and uh, I, I marked on the calendar as I did this every day, how many I put on and the three busiest days in my life were in June. And it was, uh, it's really busy. You know, you're getting chickens on the pasture, you're getting the hogs ready, you're doing the garden stuff. And I, there were three days in a row I put on 22 miles and that's just walking. <laughs> and then of course, uh, when you change, when you're moving your cattle, like when we were on really, really high bloom alfalfa, intensive bloom to avoid bloat, I'd move them sometimes. Well, I, some days, there, there were a few days I'd move them six times. So you're walking a lot. And uh, I could, like, I could not believe I put on that much my mileage. Yeah, I'm kidding. <clears throat> and, and, you, and you've got a quad too. Like, like it's not like you were yeah. walking. Yeah. But that's, yeah, it, 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 it adds up. And you basically run in a marathon every day. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah it'd be curious to see what your step counts like now that you've moved to the <laughs> well the interesting thing was uh i was having some health issues and i went to see a homeopath and she uh, measured uh me for uh one of the uh, electromagnetic field or something what's it yeah. called you probably heard yeah yeah so uh anyways it was it was really really low and uh she said what's that on your wrist is that a watch and i said no it's a fitbit oh yeah she says take it off i did and she measured it again and it went up 30 points oh wow yeah i'm I, i'm not surprised that that uh, electromagnetic stuff is is yeah. um like uh, it's it, we've kind of become dependent upon it but i i try to shut it off yeah. everything i've got a power bar and everything gets killed before i go to bed every night um you know to go to the, going back to spirit of the land there's i mean i, I <laughs> I take the time now, I guess, to think back on some of those times and what what I could have said or what I could have done. And there's one one spirit of the land. I think it was in 2015. This pretty well at the end, we're sitting out by the cabin there, and this young fellow looked at me and he said, uh, "I have a question." He said, "What's what's it going to be like? What's the planet going to be like in uh, the year?" Um, well, what he no, he said. Uh, 60 years or no 80 years by the turn of the century yeah. and I said uh, well I said I'm, I said I, I, I'm a proton 
I, I'm, you know, I like to be positive. And uh, so I said, I think it'll be okay. But I, I've thought about that since. And I wish what I would have said, it will be how you want it to be, how you dream it to be. And unless we all have that dream for a world that's good for all of us, it's not going to happen. And so uh, I, I'd love to have that that opportunity back. Yeah. And, and there's, I mean, we, it's, it's easy. Like, I mean, just like both, both you and I know that the, when you do the right thing to the land, it just, it, it jumps back and, you know, the, the biodiversity increases, the soil health increases, the, uh, it's, it, it's easy. It's, it's, it's shifting these, the, the, um, I was, I just read a book by Nicole Masters and, uh, I can't remember what it was a fellow she mentioned there is the, the biggest problem is that she is called the top paddock. The one in between your two ears <laughs> yeah. there's, there's that's where all the weeds are it's not exactly <laughs> not out in the field uh so the, the another thing i wanted to um to come back to was um uh, you were talking about the like how there's a huge different difference between um standard of living and quality of life and the, I'm, I'm just curious like like for me the the, um, uh, the Holistic management. When I when I took the the course, or I've taken two courses now, a few years ago, that was the first time I'd ever he really heard that word quality of life and gave it any kind of thought. And I, I was just curious, it, like, was did you have the same experience, or or had you always kind of been driven by you know quality of life? Because uh, it's it seems like a lot of your decisions, like you know, getting you know getting out of debt. Uh, moving to holistic management, you know, starting to do the Joel Salton model, uh, you know, leaving the farm on a high note. A lot of those this, those huge decisions in your life seem to have been driven by this deeper understanding of what what truly makes you happy. And so I'm just curious, like, how did that how did that sense come about for you? Well, I think when when we look back at our quality of life goal that we wrote, uh, I think it was the first day of the course. Um, we'd always valued uh, a family that got along. Uh, we always valued having uh, good food. Um, I wouldn't say that we always, we, we, we never had a clearly defined goal that thou must take good care of the land. We thought by taking good care of the land was using the right amount of NPK. <laughs> you know, I was drinking that Kool-Aid. Yeah. So uh, yeah, th that's where, the way they kind of gently describe the ecosystem and how it's like you got eight cylinders in your vehicle and if one cylinder isn't working it's not going to function very good and if you lose two cylinders you're probably not going to get to where you want to go to pretty soon so uh, that's how I started to look at uh, look at the land and uh, you know we'll be going on a tour and they say well you've got hawks on your farm and I said yes we have at least one uh, nesting set on, on each of the four quarters. And they said, well, how come you have hawks? Well, I said, if you look across the road here, there is a half section of land that doesn't have a tree on it. So hawks need a tree to nest. Mm -hmm. So I said, if you go on a holiday and you're going through a town and you're sleepy and tired and you want to eat, there's no restaurants and there's no hotel, are you going to keep driving? Yep. Well, that's a poor metaphor, but it works for me. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, standard of living, uh, yeah. Um, you know, there's a, I, I've noticed over the years, good friends, um, uh, you know, people a generation older than me, when they left the farm, they they feel that they deserve something. And I totally agree. They've really struggled. They've, they've worked hard and they'll treat themselves to something. But the thing that I've noticed a lot is farmers when they when they retire they buy a, a brand new pickup truck and I, <laughs> I, I say you know what good on you so they're waiting for me to buy the pickup truck so I've been eyeing a brand new truck but it's in the toy section of PV Mark you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, for, your, for your grandson yeah yeah so you know to call, I'm not I'm not putting anybody down it's just that um, you know what it seems like the spirit of the land that we farm has given us so much that. I got to tell you, I don't know what a bucket list is. Yeah. And I mean, that, but that's, what's so funny about it is, is like, I mean, it, just no matter how many times you say it, it or, or all these different gurus have said is like, you know, happiness doesn't come from things or, or that you, money can't buy happiness, all these things. 
but we just keep doing it. We keep buying the fancy trucks and the, the bigger combine and the, you know, the more land so you can compete with the Joneses next door. And it, and it just, it adds to your stress and, and you, you, you throw out the kind of eye to acre ratio that Wes Jackson talks about. And so even if you have the desires to, to look after the land properly, you, you don't have enough time or effort to, to do it. And, and it's, it's this, it's this, race to the top that oh, one of my um uh one of my friends uh she's from germany she has this saying that uh like, like apparently she had to translate it from german from german into english because she had never heard it before but she said is is um if you if you run fast enough on a hamster or sorry if you if you run fast enough on a hamster wheel it starts to look like a ladder and and I I really feel like that that just perfectly captures our yeah. our culture that we're in today and and so it's it's just it's so refreshing to see like you know folks like like you and Marie and and how how simple you live and how happy you are um, and and to, to contrast that to other farmers and even non farmers in your own age group it's I mean you guys are a, a one in a million and um, yeah it's <laughs> it's just I don't get it. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, but, but Don, you were, before you were you uh, mentioned you wanted to come back to the the concept of ecological debt. What uh, what were you what did you mean by that? Well, you you just kind of scratched the surface there. Um, <clears throat> I, I keep an eye on the farm debt, and it, it usually shows up in the Western producer every year. And oh, I think the first time I saw it was probably in about 1980 some, and I can't remember what it was then, but I was at a, Earthkeeping was a group of farmers around Leduc. And somebody told me that these guys are kind of keen, they wanna be stewards of the land. So they said, you should go. So I went to their conference and I never ever go to sit at the front of any conference cause I'm kind of shy. So. I got there half an hour late, it was a snowy day. And so there was only a few seats left there at the front. So somebody grabbed me by the arm and took me up and they sat me right in the front seat. Well, I mean, my gosh. So anyways, Elaine Sheen was the editor of the Western Producer at that time. And she was the keynote speaker and she gave a presentation and she asked, does anybody have any questions? And so uh, nobody had any questions and I couldn't believe it. But Don stood up, <laughs> that's me. And I said, I have a question. I said, I just read in August, this, this conference was in November. And I just read, I said, around the middle of August, it gave the farm debt of uh, in agriculture in Canada. And it also mentioned how many farms have, farmers have, have quit farming. And it was like about 1500 or maybe it was even more than that. But I said, Elaine, what does that mean to the publication of the Western producer? <laughs> she looked at me and she said, we're losing, we're losing subscribers. <laughs> you know, the dots are connected. So anyways, I just threw that into Coda, but uh, yeah. I, I've, I've never forgot that. And she was a really gracious lady. Uh, we had a good chat after, but uh, yeah, we're, 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 ecological debt's been going up on average about 5 billion a year. And, Two years ago, it went up 15 billion, I think it was. And when you read right to the bottom, it's usually the lenders are saying, this is a high amount of debt that we have now on the books. It's at about 115 billion now. So is, 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 that for, is that for Canada, Alberta? For Canada, yeah, for Canada. And uh, yeah, but we think it's sustainable because hey, price of land is going up. So farmers can borrow more land against, you know, against, so anyways, I, I'm just, I'm biting my fingers off because nowhere does it say we have an ecological debt. Mm. And so people say, well, when I, when I talk to people that just like you and I are talking now, they say to me, what's ecological debt? Well, I said, when we moved to the farm, I started draining wetlands or in a dry year, I disc the willows down and I disc them up and I plant a crop. Then next year, nature would show me how nature works. It would be full. So I would never farm it again. So I said, what's happening now is we're, when, when a piece of land changes hands, all that disappears. The trees disappear. You got no habitat. You're losing your native pollinators. So what is the cost 
of paying off the ecological debt. Nobody, nobody in any of those uh, articles about uh, the farm debt has ever has ever said that. I've actually written two letters to the Western producer and I never even got acknowledged that they received them. So I got a hunch, maybe they don't want to talk about it, but um, yeah. Um, and you know, we, we talk about, well, I, you and I both have met young, young farmers or young ranchers who their parents want them to take over and they don't want to go near it because their parents are already not very healthy. They're already deeply in debt and they're saying, why in the heck would I want to do that? So we... something like insanity <laughs> so uh, you know and expecting different results and we're not going to get different results and uh like globalization was hugely embraced by well our government say because they figured that you you know we can bring all this cheap food into canada and uh what they didn't realize is that's going to hollow out our villages and our, our towns and pretty soon everybody's going to be jockeying to get into the city so uh, I, I read an interesting article here. I was telling Marie today. I read it last week, and uh, I'm reading a lot more now about what's happening in Africa and South America. And um, it gave a story of this family in Africa. They have 12 children. They have a milk cow. They have a goat. And I think they have a donkey. And I, I'm thinking the donkey's probably for pulling a plow or something. I might be wrong, but two and a half acres. They feed that family, and they still have enough to barter. And Dakota, we're talking permaculture here. They know every square inch of that land. And when, when, what really bothers me in a lot of the big ag papers, it says, you, you farmers, we have a responsibility to feed the world. I'm sorry, but if Dakota, if you can teach permaculture to those people, you teach them how to fish. You know what? Once you teach them how to fish, they can learn how to fish and they can catch their own. And, and we, the f world can feed itself, but mm -hmm. we've, we've stolen, we've, they've given, we've stolen their proxy, uh, industrial agriculture, and we've taken their life away. We've genetically modified their, their the old, uh, you know, the, the, the drought proof, all those seeds that were good, like Vandana Shiva in India. She's, she's been a real stalwart of taking on, you know, the, 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 the big industrial corporations. And uh, she's got a, a seed bank where they're saving these seeds that, are their heritage seeds and they were grown for you know certain reasons and industrial agriculture wants to just wipe that all off so they can have it all and uh, really it really does concern me that when are we going to get it yeah when yeah well and it's i mean it's it's funny that even like even the stats that are published like you, you mentioned that the you know the ecological debt you know nobody's really calculated or it's it's, it's hard to not look at but even the the, the admitted figures of agriculture are so depressing. Uh, there's, a, there's a chart somewhere that I've seen, like a, they throw it up at a lot of the egg, egg, egg conferences where basically um, like the, like in, in 19, I think it was in, in the 1930s, 30% 30 of the population was farmers. And since that time, the average size of farm, farms in Canada has gone up like four times, but the, the amount of money corrected for inflation has actually gone down. So and and so that this this is the the um, the kind of cliff that that you know you, you've been talking about that we're heading towards is is land prices are going up, but the like profits are going down and the ability to generate profits is going down because the ecological services are going down. There's not enough soil. There's not enough water. There's not enough biodiversity to to grow a crop anymore. And, and I mean, just like it's this, this is a matter of, of when, not if, like we're gonna go over this cliff. And, um, you know, there's, there's a you know, new documentary out now called Kiss the Ground on, on Netflix. Yes, excellent. I, I haven't seen it myself, but, but um, um, you know, one of the stats that's mentioned in there is, is from a UN report talking about how there's, there's 60 harvests left yep. in terms of, of, of topsoil. And, and um, and so yeah, I just I, I don't. But yet you still go to like I don't know why we get the Western producer or I, I don't know if it was you who told me that called the, the Western seducer was that? No, that's, that's <laughs> Ken Ashbeater. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it, it still, it's still still somehow finds its way to our farm, but it's it's worth it just for a laugh every once in a while, because like, like the whole thing is just this this propaganda machine trying to like you know it's like I just. 
every time I, I, I flip through it, I, I imagine these farmers, they're like in the trenches in World War I and they're just, they're, they got foot rod and they're, they're depressed and yet they're kind of captains who are in these, you know, lush, uh, really nice, uh, you know, offices are like, come on, man, let's keep going. You know, it's just, you know, one more mile you're gonna go. And yeah. it, it literally reads like that. And these, these ads, you know, showing Spartan warriors with scythes running down, cutting, cutting thistles. It's just, it's so, it's over the top that, um, <laughs> that, that it's, that it's still going on, but, um, but still the, the same lines, you know, we got to feed the world and, and, uh, oh, well, you know, there's, uh, you know, we, we'd, we'd, we'd love to farm, you know, like you, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's so small and, um, it's, they, they don't get it. <laughs> well, the, uh, I read a statistic today that fits in with what you've been talking about, and that was that from 1935 to 1985, farmers were making 33 cents on the dollar. Today, they're making three cents. Yeah. And they say what's happened is inputs have gone up, equipment's gone up, and to go to once you are on the treadmill. Yeah. I mean, you and I both know a lot of, I mean, farmers aren't bad people. They, you know, they, they, their heart's in the right place, but once you get on the treadmill, and I will, I look in the mirror and I'm thinking the, the best thing that ever happened is that we jumped off when we still could. Yeah. Like we didn't have, yeah, we, we just, we were very fortunate and I know other farms that haven't been and uh, you know, not having those, uh, I call them anvils on each shoulder uh, that to me, that's, that's what debt did to me. Eh? Yeah. It takes your quality of life away. It does. And I think it's an important piece. I, I mean, I, I, I always try to caveat, Whenever I'm ripping on industrial agriculture, that that it's the um, this is not a uh, um, the the brunt of the problems of industrial agriculture don't fall on the shoulders or the, the blame doesn't fall on the shoulders of the farmers. Like no. th there has been a government uh, and and corporate and you know insurance uh, collusion for over a hundred years now, you know forcing farmers to get bigger, um, you know you know, working together to fix prices so that there's just enough uh, profit so that, you know, the, the small guys get kicked out and the big guys get bigger with, with the, the, you know, the milk mafias and the, um, and the, you know, the, the pork quotas and things like that here in Canada. So th this, this really is, it's a rigged game that has been where we're just pawns in it. And, and most of these farmers, they're trapped. Like they, they, they don't, and it's really sad because, <clears throat> You know, when they're in a group, they all kind of chant the, you know, rah, rah, feed the world stuff. But when you get them alone, and usually after a couple of beers, they, they really open up and, and, you know, things aren't doing good. And, and you know, they, they start, how, how do you guys do it? How much money do you make? And, you know, they're, they're, they're really curious, but they're, they're trapped. Like, so one example is like, if you have debt uh, as a farmer, um, and, and, and most businesses, like well, farming in particular, if you have debt, you you need to have um, uh, you know crop insurance because if if you know the bank's not going to lend you money unless they they've insured their investment, and in order to have crop insurance, you have to meet certain protocols as a farmer. So you have to spray you know so so many things. You have to do this and that and the other, and and so th literally through kind of these these different organizations working together. Um, their their farmers' hands are tied behind their backs, and it's it's really it's really depressing. And so, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the like the suicide rates of of in the agriculture sector, but it's it's the I mean, worldwide it's one of the highest uh, or suicide rates of any occupation that in like uh, basically trades. And um, but here in Alberta, like, there's there's literally a, a government funded suicide hotline just for farmers because it's 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 so bad here because of the, the stress levels and and tying that back to quality of life it's just like well like what do you do when your life is is just so awful that that that's the only option it's like we these are really tough conversations but and then the, the other piece of this is the consumers is you know I, I like to say this too is like if you've ever complained about the price of anything in the grocery store before you're to blame because I, it, somebody pays the price, whether it's the farmer or the, you know, the spouse who works a second job or the, you know, the, the wetlands getting drained or, or the income taxes or the health bill or the, the, you know, the cancer. Like somebody is going to pay that price for that cheap food. But 
you know, God, we sure like our, you know, 99 cent a pound pork sausages. <laughs> well, uh, in the 60s, the, uh, uh, what, what is it now? 26% of uh, income went to buying food. In, that's in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, right now, I think it's about between eight and a half and nine percent. And the government would like that to be even cheaper. And I'm thinking, if you keep if you keep doing that, you're going to take you're going to wipe a whole bunch of more people off the land. So, um, and you know, to go to what's happened since the '60s is there are more toys to buy, and yeah. toys have become more important than nutrient dense foods. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, through my health issues, and, and you know, one of the really good things that you and I both took part in, as well as some other some other farmers in Alberta, is the um, oh. Uh, the oh, the, omega, yeah, the omega three testing. Yeah, uh, Richard. Uh, no. Oh, what's his name? Researcher. Yes, yes, from the uh, the University of Toronto. Yeah, and, and proving that you know the omega threes uh, ratio eight, over six to three, like your eggs, I think were one to one, which is uh, better than salmon, or just as good as salmon <laughs> almost. Eh? So, yeah. and you know why? And, and if somebody said to me, well, you know that egg's expensive. But they don't realize what that can do for your health. And, and uh, this this doctor actually told us. He, I remember he answered a question at the conference there, and uh, I think it was uh, Lacombe that supplements. You you know we take supplements, but he said you can't beat getting it out of your protein. No. And like you know the the way that you know the, the product that you're putting out. I hate to use product, but the protein that you're putting out is it's solving a lot of those problems. Mm -hmm. uh, that you can bypass the health food store and probably a lot of, you know, places go, you know, times going to the clinic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just, uh, I don't know if we'll ever have the government in place that will be able to connect those dots because there's so much corporate money in it. Eh? Yeah. H however, and, and I, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. Is like, have you, you know, you've been, you've been in this kind of field of, of regenerative agriculture and or holistic management and kind of the, the permaculture, they're all the same thing um, for since, you know, the, you know, mid 1990s, have you seen, is the, is the ball rolling, you know, forward or is it, is it, is it going back? What, what, what's your, what's your tack looking back? Well, there's definitely more of an awareness. Um, <clears throat> I'm finding out that some of the people that would come on our tours, uh, even before we got too far into the tour, they knew what riparian was. They knew uh, about colony collapse disorder. Uh, a, a very few people knew about native pollinators. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know what? I think the awareness has grown, but when the uh, recession hit in 2007, as we all know, people have less money to go around. So, I mean, we some of our customers would say, Don, we're going to cut back on, we're going to take half as many chickens, less pork, less beef. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. And I says, you know what? If, if, you, if you can find your, you know, get through this, I says, you know what? Don't worry about us. You look after yourself. But in mm -hmm. right now with COVID, I think that's probably hitting some of the farms, uh, you know, again with that. I don't know. I'm kind of out of that loop now. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to, at the end of the day, you've got to, you know, look after your family. But uh, no, I, I was really, well, I was amazed at how committed some families were. And I mean, when they, when they told me that, uh, you know, they don't have a high income, but they valued the food that they were buying from farms like yours and ours and mm -hmm. a lot of those other people that we know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's actually surprising the, um, the with the lockdowns and everything that's happening right now, uh, I, there's been just a crazy increase in, in demand. Like we were actually sold out before uh, any of that stuff happened. But I actually take my phone number and my contact information off my website because I was getting so many calls. And, it, and for the first little bit, it was great because I was just passing them on to, you know, other people that, that sure. I, other farms, but they're all sold out now too. And so I was like, there's, I literally don't know anybody in Alberta that I can send them to. And, and every person that, that calls me, you know, it's, it's a, it's an hour, two hour conversation and it's it's fascinating because they they all have the same stories that you know their their health is is um, you know falling apart or they you know they, they've just you know started watching some of these documentaries 
like you know the biggest little farm or or um you know kiss the ground or the or they've you know they've seen the the ted talks about you know you know regenerative agriculture and the gay browns and 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 these people they're, they're so passionate like they're like they don't need to be educated anymore they just they they just need to be they just want to buy and it's, it's i like I mean, for, for you, like, uh, and I know my parents struggled with it for years, like in the 19, uh, 1988 was when they switched to organics and there was almost no market for it. And, yeah. and they just, they just got screwed left, right and center. And, and so you, you guys kind of started in 1996, like, like, did you start to see like the marketing getting easier towards the end? Like as you, as you were, you know, building up your customer base and, and all that, because like, I, I just feel like, like it's been so easy. Like it's our farm really started back up again with direct marketing about uh, be in 2012. But um, like every year, there's been like a step change in just how easy it's been to could because the demand has just been exponential. Yeah, it, it it did it did get better to go to and uh, let's see. I'd say in about 2015, we started instead of doing I don't know 1,500 chickens, we would do maybe 900 and then. You know, we slowly phased out, but no, and, and we started passing our contacts on to other farmers. But um, yeah, I know that we were trying to find a deep freeze for a friend here a while ago, and uh, the local there was nothing in cameras. They over, I think it was nine cubic foot, and uh, they couldn't figure it out. And I said, you know what? I said, I think I figured it out. I said, people are because of the COVID, they want to stock up so they don't have to go to the store and stand in a lineup to get food from far away that they don't know who, who raised it. They don't know what it had for medication. They don't know all that stuff. Eh? And I think that, I think, I, mean, I hate to use the word good comes out of a, a problem with COVID, but I think that is, there's an awakening that maybe we have to get back to valuing the way that our food is raised and grown and the people that do it, how they're treated. Uh, I mean, Forsberg, they've built onto their uh, processing plant and they're making it uh, so that they can work through, you know, they can have social distancing in, in, their, in, their, in their rooms there. So I'm thinking, wow, that's really proactive. And I think what I'd like to see, and I think you probably would too. Uh, I mean, I know processing on the farm, like you're talking about, that's that's been a big step, but uh, to these little plants, well, Forsberg isn't a little plant, they do a lot of beef, but to go to white, we could have those in just about every town, I think, if 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 there's if there's a will there. Oh yeah, and, and we're gonna need it. Like the mm -hmm. a lot of the, the butcher shops that I knew like know uh, in uh, in Alberta right now, they're booking into like next year. Yeah, like, Forsberg's booking into July. Yeah. And like, yeah, and like Forsberg was always like that, but the the yeah. one of my buddy called me, he's like, Do you know any butchers? The, these guys are booked up until next December. It's like it was 12, it was a 12 month wait. Wow. And um, so I, I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of um, our food system is very fragile right now. And it's, it's hanging on by, by a thread. But, but the, the exciting thing is like the, the consumer demand is there because they they themselves are educated about, about the importance of, of, of regenerative agriculture and, and how the, the like the, the sticker price is, um, like that's just one aspect of of the you know the, the accounting that needs to be be taken uh, looked after and and so it's like we I think we, we've we've got the um, the consumer interest is building the farming interest is is coming up as well like there's there's a lot of you know young farmers that are are starting out uh, I, I I can see everything kind of ratcheting up I just hope that it can you know ratchet up in time before um, you know something else happens and and there's there's you know food shortages or um you know distribution problems like, we're, like there's already been shortages for a lot of of you know goods um a lot of them have been non-essential but um like so it's yeah i i, I go back and forth between um I, i'm i'm cautiously optimistic <laughs> let's put it that way but but like but like you said it's it's if we want it to be better it will be and um and i i can i can see that in in, uh, in people well there's have you ever done any csl projects with augustine yeah what we we uh, community service learning yeah we yeah. Did, did one um uh is it last year we did a, a, a bird monitoring program for uh, as kind of like a, a keystone monitoring indicator for the overall health of our farm 
there, well, uh, there's there's one project that we offered probably three years in a row, but it, it would have taken a lot of work, but I'm gonna share it with you because I think it would be one that would be valuable. Um, Camrose has a population of about 21,500 people. Mm -hmm. And if you look at how much an adult consumes in protein, fruits and vegetables, milk products, all that, mm -hmm. Uh, it's about between 1,500 and 1,700 pounds. So that gives you kind of a baseline of how much protein you need, vegetables and all that other stuff, milk. So you look at the population, you break it down into certain age groups. And for the younger, it would go down. But where I'm coming at, come, coming, coming from this ad is, uh, you know, people that have, okay, even if they're vegan, you put vegans in there, you put your pork, your beef, your uh, poultry, uh, lamb. And so you, you start finding out basically how much of that protein, how many pounds or how many tons do you need? And then you start looking at a farm and you, you take a farm and let's say, let's just make a model. That model will raise 60 hogs, that model will raise 2000 chickens, they'll raise 150 turkeys, they'll raise, anyways, you know where I'm going with this. And so what I'm trying to figure out is if we can, uh, f find out how many of these smaller farms we need and food security. That's what triggered this whole conversation right now that we're having. Uh, we, we could start building food security around our towns, villages, and even cities with, I think with this model. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I did the, um, I did the math. I gave a presentation. I think it was last year. Uh, yeah. It was one of the questions I, I was my, my two favorite questions is like, is like yeah but does your farm make any money and two is yeah but you know we can never feed the world like that and so <laughs> i actually now at, at, i keep those uh slides kind of at the bottom of my deck hoping that somebody will ask it <laughs> at a conference or something because i can pull it out but yeah. the um the i'll leave the money thing aside but just just in terms of uh, food production it's like based on like what our we, we've got a 250 acre farm and uh, in, in some years, not every year, because like we're we're still, you know, uh, overcoming. We're we're paying down our ecological debt that sure. has been built up over the last hundred years from past farmers and also you know ourselves when we, we didn't know what we were doing. But um, the uh, even even right now with our current numbers of production, our two hundred fifty acre farm um, is uh, if if you were to scale that model up to all of the agricultural land in Alberta which is about 50% grassland, 50% green land, which is kind of what our farm is, yeah. um, we could feed 10 million people. The population of Alberta is 5 million. And like, and like the numbers we're producing are trivial yeah. uh, right now because we're, we're in the early stages of, of developing these systems. Uh, <clears throat> we basically do like, you know, 30 pigs and, and you know, 15 to 20 beef a year and about uh, 50 dozen eggs a week. So it's basically, it's enough for it's like 50 or 60 families to have a couple of eggs. And like, so every, every person could get like, uh, it was like two eggs, uh, a couple hundred grams of pork, a couple hundred grams of beef, um, some, some milk, some berries and some vegetables. It's like super simple. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so you, you scale that up. It's like, we can double the, the feed two times over the population of Alberta. And, and plus the production on our farm could easily double or triple or even quadruple based on where we, uh, our current kind of hay yields compared to historical yields. We know that we've got room to improve there. And, and, then, and then you scale that up to the whole world in terms of all the agricultural land. It's, there's no problem. We, we can totally do this with these, these uh, like smaller scale, you know, one family on every quarter section, uh, um, you know, getting back to, you know, kind of 20 to 30% of the population is, as um, in the field of agriculture. It's, it's easy, but it, it, and, and it, and it would be profitable, but it would be profitable for the farmers. It wouldn't be profitable for these multinational corporations and, and, um, <clears throat> and these governments and, that make kick and, and off of their, their uh, free trade agreements and, and all yeah. <clears throat> and the other thing to go to that uh, I think we often miss sometimes is uh, if, if there's young people on those, far on those farms and they have one or two or three kids, all of a sudden you've got schools again, you've yeah. got volunteer organizations, uh, like you're going to have less social programs. And yeah. you know what? One thing that you focused on is 
uh, the vulnerable and the, the, the uh, marginalized in your community. You have a, a you know, erase poverty, uh, sure. bring nutrition back to people who don't have proper nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe a school lunch program would be valuable or breakfast yeah. program. I think that's low hanging fruit to get kids, you know, uh, thinking, you know, get, get their stuff back together. And uh, no, I just think that the spinoffs are phenomenal. And then, you know, start going into if you're, if, and, and this is going to be done regeneratively, the spinoff is, or spillover, whatever you call it, you got biodiversity, you got carbon sequestration, you're starting to renew the water cycle, hydrological cycle, like, you know, uh, well, you and I, you know, it's only two in the morning, we can keep going, eh? <laughs> uh, totally. Um, well, if, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're up for a bit more, actually, there's, there's one other thing I wanted to, to touch on, which was the, uh, the, you mentioned carbon sequestration. I was just curious if, if you could um, uh, talk briefly about some of the work that you've done on, uh, on, on your farm with, with measuring carbon sequestration and, um, you know, some of that, that work. And because it, it's been a couple of years since, since I've got an update on that. And so, yeah, I'm just curious to see where it, where it's gone. Well, the first, uh, we got a call from the University of Alberta, <clears throat> I think it was in about 2013, and they did a three, oh no, it was 2012, they did a three-year program on, uh, <clears throat> they, they set up their uh, e equipment that measures, I, I'm not sure what all it measured, you probably know this better than I do, but in the bush and also in the tame pasture, and they would come They'd come in the spring to monitor it. So they'd come every two weeks, I think it was, right until fall. Anyways, they'd just come, I just, you know what, just go through the yard to get to where you gotta go. And anyhow, they, uh, I told them that uh, one time one guy was coming through the yard and I asked him, what's, uh, you know, are you finding anything out? And he, he looked at me and he says, you know, we are. He said, you're actually sequestering more carbon in your tame pasture than you are in the bush. And actually that surprised me too. So I said, it, that, that should be a good thing. He says, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyways, we, uh, uh, Scott Chang, who teaches agroforestry at the U of A, he started teaching a, a course, a summer course for uh, uh, students from China. And the first year he had 24 students and he asked if he could bring them out to the farm in the afternoon. So we did. And uh, yeah, it was quite different for them because a lot of them from, Beijing, uh, some were even wearing masks because the, the uh, pollution is very bad over there. So then uh, 2018, they came again and they stayed for the whole day. There were 40 students and they had all kinds of questions like, uh, we, we've never been in a wild place like this. In other words, you can't see people around. And like, they were just running around like kids having a really good time. So anyways, I asked Scott before he left, I said, Scott, uh, you know what, before we leave the farm, I said, I would like to do uh, a test on carbon sequestration in our tame pasture, in our native pasture, and also in the bush. Well, he said, I'll see what I can do. So he, and I said, whatever it costs, let's do it. So he phoned me back a couple of days later and he says, you know, Don, he said, you, you've, I've been bringing students out from my courses for, I think, since about 2002 or 2004. Um, he says, we want to do the whole farm. So they set up a grid and they had a research group and uh, they came out in July. There was a drought that year. So they said they can do a quarter section in about three hours. They came back from the yard after two hours and they pulled, I said, how did it go? And they pulled out their test. They'd done, they'd done two tests. And none of them, they could, couldn't get the auger into the ground far enough because of the drought. Yeah. And they even went into the bush because they thought animal, animal compaction. Mm -hmm. They went into the bush where they, we, we hardly ever graze the bush. They, they could get it down maybe another five centimeters. So mm -hmm. we missed that one. And you know what? I regret that because I would really like to have known what we had because when I gave Scott the, the maps of every quarter of our farm, we had the year that all the trees were planted, like the shelter belt on one quarter was planted a certain year, the eco buffer another year. So say we had trees planted in 1984 uh, and trees planted uh, 10 years later, he could actually compare the carbon that was sequestered. Eh? Mm. And so uh, anyways, we missed out on that. But yeah, I've been following this and as much as I would like to see farmers paid for carbon sequestration, uh, I, I think that uh, if, if, if some big corporation wants to say, John and Marie, we will buy your carbon credits, 
so that we can keep on keeping on. And that's a non-starter for me because we don't want to go there, eh? But yeah. if you were make a commitment, say in five years, you're going to be down to this, you know, this amount that you promise. And if you're not, there's a penalty that, you know, hold their feet to the fire. But, you know, that whole thing is, and even now, I think, uh, oh, you've probably talked to Kim Cornish. She's been involved in this. And I think they're getting, I, I don't know if, are they getting LIDAR maps where they can actually, without doing the actual testing or satellite, there's some kind of a it's like lidar it gets brighter and you know that yeah it's it's like i think it's ground penetrating radar or something that they're yeah. using it's yeah. it's crazy expensive it's like fifteen thousand dollars okay quarter. okay but yeah. um yeah no i i totally agree with you that like that my interest in in carbon sequestration is purely from like the carbon cycle and how that ties in with the nutrient cycle and the water cycle and yeah. you know biodiversity uh i i personally think that the carbon credits is a um <laughs> is is a, a wild goose chase at best and a um a, another um you know it's a carrot or, yeah well I, I think it's another kind of chain around farmers necks and that is is going to be used to further enrich corporations or like you said rob peter to pay paul yeah. and not really addressing like one of my one of my friends they and it was a couple of days ago he was he was, um, I'd never heard this before. And this, I don't know if it's actually true or not, but he was talking about how there's, there's, uh, there's factories in China that all they do is burn rubber tires so that then they set up a business, they're on the carbon creating thing. So they create pollution so that when a company wants to, to make, to buy less pollution, they can pay them to burn less tires. <laughs> and it's just like classic capitalism of, of yeah, yeah. just treat symptoms never address the root cause. And, um, and so like the, I, I, yeah, I personally think that it's, it's a, it is a distraction, but, um, but it was really interesting to, like you just said, how like your, your tame pastures that were, were managed. It's like, like for folks who don't know, like tame pasture would be things like, you know, like alfalfa and brome and Timothy and, and um, like basically non-native uh, or um, yeah, non-native pasture grasses that were being rotationally grazed on your farm, they were sequestering more than a quote natural forest, and like most people wouldn't wouldn't think that. But it's and this is the this is just one of, more example of the role of humans in ecosystems. Is like we we as an animal can partner with other organisms in the ecosystem to to create a step change that couldn't happen. If we weren't there, we're a keystone species in the same way that wolves, you know, reintroduced into you know the the Yellowstone National Park changed the grazing habits of the elk and the whole of ecosystem mm -hmm. passed back. Mm -hmm. When humans kind of remember who they are and, and what their function is within the ecosystem, we're gonna have the same effect over the entire planet. And you know, your guys' farm was just a classic example of of what can be done in in just a few decades. Uh, cause like how many, how many trees did you guys plant? It was like over 60,000, wasn't it? Actually to go to, I, when I was cleaning out my filing cabinet, I, uh, I had to, uh, put some of the papers up in flames because even though I enjoyed reading them, I looked at my birth certificate, and I said, you know, I'll never get a chance to read all these. So I called heavily, but I kept one file, uh, because every year that we got trees, we kept the, uh, well through PFR, they were free, but if, if you had to buy them, I kept the invoices. So this winter my goal is to put down all the species how many of each and but we figure it's over a hundred thousand oh yeah 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 that's crazy yeah but you know what you introduced me to lidar with the lidar maps oh yeah okay i i read an article here about three years ago and what caught what caught me was in the title it said something lidar has lidar mapping has uncovered something else here and it was in Guatemala where the I didn't realize the Mayans were in Guatemala yeah. and so uh, they could tell by LIDAR that there was a civilization under here and, and the, the author that was uh, that was uh, writing this article he was saying they had everything figured out they had drained every wetland so that they could you know take all the water and, and irrigate and I'm thinking oh and he said they made every square inch count and I'm thinking this messenger we have to get rid of him because that's not the way it works he's just they've just destroyed everything <laughs> no totally there's um uh one of the one book that kind of mentions the same stuff is um uh 1491 by charles c mam 
that it's like the, the new revelations of um, the Americas before Columbus. And um, another really good one is um, uh, Graham Hancock. He's a new book called America Before, which which talks about a lot of this stuff. And it's um, uh, yeah, like they, they this this myth that um, like for example Charles C. Mann's book 1491, he, he talks about how there's kind of three myths about um, North America before Columbus. One was that like it was it was um, sparsely populated. Um, two was that the the uh, the the people um, ha hadn't been been here for very long, and three that the people didn't have uh, a lot of uh, kind of agency over the land. Like they were kind of stepping lightly and doing little things here and there. And and this book just destroys all those myths. Like there was massive earthworks. Uh, there's there's mounds larger than the Great Pyramid of of, of Egypt um, and like Monk's Mound and in the United States. Uh, you know, you mentioned the the irrigation networks that were found. You know, in also in the Amazon rainforest, but in, in Guatemala. Um, there's there's research now that's that's uh, looking at kind of the 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 uh, statistical breakdown of of plants and and how they kind of like how they would grow in, in a quote unquote natural ecosystem. And when you compare that kind of that norm to the rainforest, it's the rainforest is a huge outlier. The rainforest has way more human uh, kind of beneficial trees, particularly like fruit and nut trees than any other ecosystem on the planet. And so there's, there's really good evidence that the rainforest was literally a forest garden that had been cultivated for, for thousands of years. And, and so like this, None of this stuff is new. We, we we can totally do this. Oh yeah, that, like there was there was over uh, between you know a hundred million plus people in in North America, um, which before it was like what they thought there was less than a million. So like even these pre-industrial civilizations, like there's you know there's three hundred million people in North America today, or, or four hundred million. Like we can totally do this. We can totally be sustainable or beyond sustainable. We, we, we can be regenerative. We can build soil health. We can do all these things. And, um, and it can taste better, it could be more fun. And, and we can have a quality of life as well as raising the standard of living um, and all these things. But it, it, it really all, for me, it starts with, with agriculture and, and, and not only how we grow food, but how we relate to, to the land. And um, I just, I, I, unless you have any, any closing thoughts, um, maybe this is a good place to end, but, but, um, yeah, what, what <clears throat> the one question I wanted to ask before we go actually, Don, is, is, um, what would you, what would you tell yourself, um, if, if you, if, if you were, a, you know, a young farmer or like a, a young person who was growing up, who grew up on a farm or, or wanted to come back to the farm, what would you tell kind of, a uh, a young agriculturist or one of the agriculturists? today, given all of the, the, the journey that you've been on? Well, boy, that, that's a tough one, Dakota, because I think you and I both know you have to have some land, eh? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, the first, that's the first step of being a farmer, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, but if, if you can somehow pass, go and collect your land, uh, like you do in Monopoly, Monopoly uh, yeah, I, I just think that, well, like the lady said, Read Wendell Berry. That's a heck of a good start. And you mentioned all the Leopold. Can't say enough about him either. But yeah, but I would say get hooked up with somebody like yourself that uh, is into permaculture. And Dakota, the what I call the unfair advantage that you have, you're not preaching. You're walking the talk on your farm. Uh, that's that's huge uh, to me. If if I go to buy a in the old days when I'd buy a secondhand piece of equipment, I go and ask a few guys that I knew had one, eh? And I'd say, you know, how is this working? And I knew that they they'd used it, eh? And they they would tell me what the good things were and what the bad. And so, uh, yeah, I, and I know that you're hooked up with the young agrarians, and I think that's important because I think right now being a young person who wants to farm can be pretty lonely because you're basically looking at the big ag papers and there's there's a few stories in there I think that do cover the small farms but the majority are from the big guys and that's a non-starter for most and I think they realize that uh, with debt comes stress and relationships uh, can crumble so no I uh, I think that permaculture and 
if somehow, uh, and you've probably, have you run across somebody in Alberta that is doing something pretty phenomenal on five acres? Uh, like I know this, this steel pony there, I haven't talked to him in a while, but he was doing quite a bit of garlic stuff. And I'm just trying to think of somebody because we need those examples. Like we need your example, but yeah. uh, I, I would, I really, I don't want to see, I shouldn't say I don't want to, but I really believe that we have to get smaller and we need examples like, like you and smaller and smaller and smaller yeah. because there's a niche, there's a niche for everybody. Totally. I, I, I can't think of anybody who's kind of uh, acreage size. There's lots of other farms that are doing similar stuff to what we're doing and even bigger than us. And, and I know lots of people kind of living within cities who are on, you know, quarter and eighth of an acre yards that are just incredible but I uh, personally, I, I can't, uh, nothing comes to mind for, for those, um, yeah, kind of that three to four acre, acre piece. But um, yeah, like, to be honest, like that's, I, some days I have, I have dreams of just, I'd like to just have only three or four acres because it, it, it comes back to that, that I'd acre ratio again, is like the, the less land you have, the more attention you can give it. And, and so the, um, like you can put a lot more into a smaller piece of property. So it's, it's, it's not about, um, you know, having, having tons of farmland. And actually one of my, one of my colleagues, Curtis Stone, he has, um, he wrote a book called the urban farmer. Yes. Where, uh, you know, he's making, you know, a six figure income uh, off of like a, a quarter of acre of land in a city that he didn't own. Uh, and um, so it, th there's, there's really is kind of, uh, you know, from from that size all the way up to you know hundreds of acres like like you guys got and everywhere in between it it, it takes it takes all kinds uh, absolutely well further to that um, I I think that and this is having to be a little bit forward or brave might be the answer or bold is uh, you put an ad in the local paper saying that are there any farmers in the area who would like to allow a young wannabe farmer that uh, is uh, that wants to grow food, and uh, you could, you know, flesh this story out. Um, regenerative, you know, regenerative agricultural principles, uh, because permaculture isn't in a lot of people's vocabulary. I think you've got to be careful of that until you can sit down and talk to them face to face. But mm -hmm. I really think that uh, there's. There's people around here that would, if you could find five young people uh, that would be interested, and if we could find uh, some plots of land, whether either they could work together on it or individually, whatever, uh, but they'd have to have access to water and uh, maybe have local people that are uh, keen to sponsor this, uh, sponsor a course that you would teach so that I think we all win. Yeah, well, and that is um, one of the, the projects that my colleagues and I have kind of in the works right now is is this goal to set up some kind of a, a land trust or a land institute who mm -hmm. that that basically takes burnt out old farms, um, you know, starts to regenerate them and um, and trains people in the regeneration of them and then kind of sells those those properties or offers those properties back up to the to the the students or the broader community and and kind of start this this you know like a like a kind of a land flipping program that's that's based on regenerative agricultural principles but um but it, it doesn't have to be uh, like there's just so many good models out there like you know guys like greg judy who's developed you know uh, uh, the ability to, to lease land from other farmers or uh, you know, like your idea of of partnering with an existing farm and and kind of going through the succession because uh, you know, like, like you, there's, there's a lot of, of kids who are raising the farm that, that don't want to come back to the farm for whatever reason, you know, they've got other careers. And so there's so many, what is it, the, the average age of, of um, farmers in Canada is in their kind of mid to late fifties. And so there's a lot of land that's going to get transferred in the next few years. And a lot of these people have the same values that you, that you and Marie did, do, and, and they don't want to sell to the Hutterites. They don't want to sell to the, the big farm who's going to cut down all the trees and, and you know, bulldoze the, the, the um, uh, you know, the, the pastures that, that have been, you know, you've been painstakingly building over the last, you know, decades. And, and so if, if you can, if you can get in, into a situation like that and you can start this, this intergenerational succession where, you know, the previous generation is, is, 
is um, is teaching the the new generation because there's there's so much like like even even being born and raised on the same piece of land and you probably see the same things like like I, I still am learning things and having insights about the the the, the land that I, I I've, I've lived on my entire life like it never it never stops and then and I'm still learning things from my parents who lived on it you know decades longer than I have and so they're like. I, I, I see exactly what you're saying. This this idea of, of intergenerational succession is a, is a huge piece to um, to really getting the most out of these the, the most potential out of these regenerative systems because you, you um, the land has stories to tell and if and if every every generation has to learn those stories again, they could just they just waste time. <clears throat> And uh, Richard Bazinet, that was the fellow who did Richard, the testing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The reason I'm uh, bringing him up is that I think you and I are going to have this whole thing finished by the time we finish <laughs> uh, on these uh, operations. I mean, some of these uh, young farmers could even raise poultry and pork, et cetera, but uh, start doing the omega-3, the, the, the essential fatty acid testing, not only to uh, for those young farmers, but also as an awareness to the community and to uh, you know uh, the, the, the health benefits and then also bricks. We haven't talked about bricks yet, you know? And uh, if, you've, if you're growing vegetables, you can uh, show the consumer that, hey, here's my strawberries. Highest bricks is 15 and I got 14. Would you rather buy mine or do you wanna buy yours from the one with nine? And if they say, what's the difference? You get to tell the story. And you know, Dakota, I think we've got to start putting this together because I think, I think people, even though they don't know it, they're craving this information because there's a lot of not only dis, dis-ease, but dis-ease, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah. And I think we can eat our way out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And and uh, it's 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 pretty pretty simple. We just need to to start doing it. Um, so yeah, any any closing thoughts before we we finish off? I think we've, we did just just about uh, an hour and a half here. It's pretty good. Well, uh, this, this is guess... one of our this is one of our shorter conversations we've had. <laughs> <laughs> well. There's been a misconception, and I, I think I've, I've meant you probably know what it is, but some people have, that know that you and I have hooked up, I think it was in 2011 or 2012, that uh, they've come to me and they've said, you know, it's sure good that Dakota's had you for a mentor. And I start laughing and they say, what's the joke? I says, he's mentoring me. <laughs> so, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, it's made the world difference to me. And I think that uh, I'll, I'll probably be calling you more now that I'm retired so that I can... Yeah. You don't I, do some work and get tired. I'm, I'm shocked, actually, that I, you haven't been knocking on my door to, to milk my cows or anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm not going to put that on the list. No, I'll, I'll, I'll be around. I just we're everybody's being cautious with the COVID, so yeah. But uh, it, it'll it'll pass. We'll we'll get through it, and uh, yeah. And I mean, I believe this kind of farming has an answer to COVID too. We we get animals out of confinement and start putting them on uh, renewing the countryside with young farm families. Yeah, well, and, and I mean the the best way to you know boost your immune system is is through healthy food, and yeah, yeah. it's yeah, it, it all yeah. it all comes back to that. So no, no, thank you very much for all you've done. I appreciate it, and I value your friendship. As uh, li- likewise, Don, you've been a it's 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 a, a absolute gift to to see somebody and and to to have somebody to look up to who's 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 gone before and and. And still, uh, <laughs> you've gone through the mud, and you still got a grin on your face. So it's, it's <laughs> I, I, I hope that I'm, um, I'm half as happy as you are when, <laughs> when I'm your age. So, okay. Well, it was a great chat. Say hi to uh, Marie for me, and uh, I hope we can we can connect soon. Okay. Thanks. Take care. Okay.